Nice to see you. Hello, everyone. Hi, nice to see you. Hi there. Can you hear me? Hi there. Can you hear me all? Yes, we can. Thank you. Yes. <laughs> and we're waiting for Rick. Wonderful. Look, let me tell you, this panel is very short. I realized it was short, but I just noticed that it's only like 40 minutes. So we're all going to have to be snappy, okay? <laughs> and you know, no I think you're all veterans at this, so you know it'll be it'll be really good. In terms of order, we went through this, but I just want to, in my mind, I went through it a little bit again. I'm going to start uh, with uh, Rick. Then I'm going to come over to you, Lori. Then I'm going to come over to you, Kathleen, uh, okay. Frederick, and then I'm going to end uh, with um, uh, Victoria in terms of the first round really quick. And then we're going to move to kind of the more interactive side. Okay. Victoria, Has there been a lot of interaction on these other panels? I've been on a couple, but they seem pretty quiet. No, it's really the platform is, you know, okay, but it's not for, you know, people are mostly listening. Uh, Kathleen. So we'll do our typical thing. And you know that magic wand question that I'm going to ask you. So <laughs> that always keeps people engaged for a little bit. <laughs> and it's fun. <laughs> I hope everyone's well, happy. I can't remember what it was, but I'm sure we'll all get it together. <laughs> <laughs> it's basically if you had a magic wand and you could change one or two things that you think would be really catalytic, game changing, what would they be? Right? Right. Okay. Yep. So basically, you know, because it's going to go so quickly, um, it's gonna, you know, we might only end up having two rounds, okay? So, you know, but that's fine. The whole point is just to make it short, sweet, and and very exciting, okay? All right. I think we have two more minutes. It's uh, and they'll let us know in a, you know, when we go live. Great. I won't do and you know forgive in advance. I'm just going to do the top line of your bios. You're all too amazing to go through them all. We'll waste half the time talking about all your accomplishments. Okay. <laughs> I'm so insulted. <laughs> <laughs> you can just get mine. So will, I mean, our mics, will our mics be turned off? Um, I don't yeah. think so. I don't think so. Uh, and it's totally fine because right now, at least, I don't hear any feedback. So I'd say keep them on uh, unless they let us know. Otherwise, there are people in the background doing their thing. So <laughs> that is beyond, that's the, the Oz stuff that I know about, Kathleen. <laughs> <laughs> so and is, is Rick not joined us yet? Oh, I don't know. Do, do we see how many people are actually, yeah. Will we see how many people we have in, in audience or not really? You can see it by, if you go to the right hand side of your screen, you'll see like a, two people, kind of larger as well. You see five right now. Uh, which is us? Which is us right now. And then when we go live, then people will start. Okay. Showing. Okay. Do we have any idea who signed up for this? I guess we don't, right? No. Not really. So we have John Cook, our wonderful Thunderbird alum, who's joined from Switzerland. Uh, and so, you know, you'll start to see people joining. OK. Yeah, we were going to do a lot of social media about it around it because we have such a huge audience. But it you had to pay one hundred ninety five dollars to log on. So that was a little bit of a disincentive for me to get out to the masses. You know, so we I, didn't I, do it. I hear you. I hear you. OK, I wonder if we're live. It says nothing. Let me know just yet. So we'll give everybody a minute, and then the part of it is the video, and then you, you can promote the video, right, of the of the session. There ah, we there's go. <laughs> Doing my just on time <laughs> entry. Right? Learn from the master. <laughs> All right. Well, you know, we'll give everybody thirty seconds uh, and welcome. Uh, it's great to have this group. Uh, I'll, like, we'll get uh, the some panel uh, some attendees in and then we'll get started. Great.
Welcome everyone. My name is Sanjeev Kagram. I'm the Dean and Director General CEO of the Thunderbird School of Global Management, the number one ranked school for management in the world. Uh, as part of the Arizona State University Enterprise, the number one university for innovation six years running. Uh, we are also the number one school for SDG impact in the United States and five in the world. Part of our commitment is inclusion, innovation and impact at global scale. Nothing is more important and planetary scale for that matter. And certainly nothing is more important to the future of humanity than the climate. We know that there are three critical pillars in climate transformation. The first is, of course, uh, adaptation. We have to adapt to a climate that has already changed. I just drove uh, with my partner through the California fires. We actually were involved in the Australian fires because her family's from Australia. We know what is already happening uh, around us and we have to adapt to it. The second is mitigation, achieving that 1.5 degree Celsius target, making sure that we move away from uh, fossil fuels to a very much, much more sustainable energy uh, system. But the third and very critical pillar that has been underemphasized that we're going to focus on in this panel is what we call climate restoration and within that specifically carbon removal at scale. Now, over the last two years, this third pillar has grown increasingly uh, in importance in understanding and visibility uh, and more and more stakeholders across the public, private, nonprofit sectors, academic institutions like ourselves are all in because we see this as absolutely central. Uh, to the future of the planet and humanity, and to sustainable prosperity for all, which is our vision. I want to introduce our panelists today. We have uh, uh, Dr. Rick Parnell, President and CEO of the Foundation for Climate Restoration, Kathleen Rogers, the President of Earth Day Network, Victoria Fine, the CEO of the, of the nonprofit organization called Orb Media, uh, Frederick uh, Demevius, who has just launched uh, Planet First Partners, an evergreen investment platform focused on challenges of the planet today, and Lori Quitry, who's the Vice President of Business Development at Carbon Engineering. So I'm gonna start with Rick so that we can be, we have 35 minutes, Rick, so we're all gonna go fast and punchy, make this really exciting for everyone, wherever they may be. Before I pass it to you, of course, we hope that everyone is healthy, safe uh, with their loved ones uh, in these difficult times. Uh, Rick, why climate restoration now? Why carbon removal now? We've come so far in sh such a short period, thanks to your leadership, the leadership of the Foundation for Climate Restoration. This is the time, why is that? Thank you, my friend. So the time is now because mitigation, adaptation, renewable energy is doing well. It's not as good as it could be, but it, it is on a course. The part that we have neglected is the legacy carbon that's in the atmosphere of the last two centuries. You know, we've been geoengineering the environment since the beginning of the industrial revolution, and we have two centuries of carbon in the atmosphere that we have to get out. Little known is that when we reach net zero in 2050, and I'm confident the world will do it, we, we, we will find a way. Um, you're seeing a lot of that now. But when we get to net zero in 2050, 95% of the carbon that is the problem will still be in the atmosphere. You will still have the storms. You will still have the fires because of the legacy carbon. There is a lot of talk about let's do carbon removal post 2050. Not acceptable. We can do this now, and we must do this now. So for us at the Foundation for Climate Restoration, it is about the third leg of the stool, as our dear friend Kathleen Rogers says. It's the third leg of the stool. It's the third pillar of climate action. Let's work to restore the climate, restore the oceans now, simultaneous to mitigation and adaptation. Fantastic. I'm going to go over to you, Lori. Um, we did a report that we launched in Davos uh, just this past year, uh, this year, uh, right as the pandemic was emerging on, on the world, where we've we, we, we sort of estimated that there's three to five trillion dollars of market opportunities, economic opportunities uh, in this carbon removal space. You at Carbon Engineering have been amongst the leaders in direct air capture, which is one of the key ways that we do this. Tell us and tell the audience why technological solutions particularly, but solutions more generally, are increasingly coming to scale and marketable uh, in this area of carbon removal. Lori? Great, thanks Sanjeev, and thanks to everyone for your interest in carbon removal. Um, to answer the question, uh, carbon engineering, as as you've mentioned, is have, have we've been working on direct air capture at scale, and it's important to know that it's not it's not magic to scrub CO2 from the atmosphere. We've known actually how to do that for for a long time. That's how we put people in spacecraft and submarines, is we know how to scrub the CO2 out. What we didn't know was how to do it at very large climate relevant scale and really cheaply because we have scarce resources to um, 
to help the climate and we need to be able to do so as economically as we can. So, um, you know, why the buzz now, why, what's possible? We were actually founded in 2009 by some seed funding by Bill Gates um, to try to see, could we go to very large scale with the scrubbing and do so very cheaply? Fast forward to today, uh, we have the technology and uh, we're actually commercializing it now. We published a paper a couple of years ago that showed how we will get to a cost of $100 a ton uh, to scrub the CO2. And so that's a bit, that's quite revolutionary compared to the $600 to $1,000 that it used to take with traditional techniques. Um, so we're going as fast as we can. It's possible now technologically. Um, and there are policies in place to actually make it economic to build these plants. So we're, we're trying to go as fast as we can, but they require a lot of capital and they take time to build. Um, so we're really excited by new policies coming online and new voluntary efforts by companies and governments and individuals around the world wanting to see it go even faster to help accelerate the rollout. Lori, could you say a bit more about what those policies are that are creating the enabling environment for direct air capture as one of the technological, very critical technological solutions for carbon removal? Sure, yeah. Um, so the leading uh, policy that's, that's helping motivate uh, the rollout is the California Low Carbon Fuel Standard um, that was had previously just rewarded uh, the creation of a low carbon fuel um, and really exciting for us um, because the, the, the problem is, as Rick was saying, is the absolute number of CO2 molecules floating around us, um, whereas the low carbon fuel standard previously rewarded the creation of a low carbon fuel that avoided a ton of new fossil emissions. Um, so they expanded the, the policy in 2019 to allow for the, the um, removal of a ton of atmospheric CO2 and the permanent sequestration of that atmospheric CO2 to count for an LCFS credit. And so that plus the 45Q tax credit in the U.S. allows us to move forward. Um, there are other low carbon fuel standard policies in place that are already contemplating expanding to, to include negative emissions just the same way that uh, California has done. So really exciting in the policy space to, to look at the arithmetic, the, the math of how many carbon molecules, CO2 molecules are up and how to, how to remove them and, and reward them. And one more quick question. What are some of the other technological solutions that you see out there that are increasingly going to market that can contribute to carbon removal and utilization? Great. Um, so for us, you know, as a capture company, uh, as soon as you capture that CO2 molecule, the question becomes, how do you put it to work uh, in a way that makes it economic to build that air scrubbing, air, air treatment infrastructure? Um, and so people are looking at putting that CO2 into durable products like like concrete, uh, which we're excited about. There are other director capture companies working on on things at scale, bioenergy, carbon capture and storage. So putting some of those that biomass into durable storage underground. All of these, um, we're seeing a shift away from sort of temporary storage into that durable storage, whether it's in geologic uh, reservoirs, which will take the lion's share of, of the um, CO2 that we're going to pull out of the atmosphere, but also into a whole ecosystem of uh, a durable storage carbon products, which is, which um, is great, more I, is better. We need everything. Uh, and so in, in a way, this is a big mental model shift to see CO2, not just as an externality, but a potential input to a circular economy approach for new products uh, for our global green economy. Um, Kathleen, I think you're still there. I think I've lost some video, but I hope you're still there. We want to go over to the natural solutions. What are some of the great natural solutions that we're starting to really advance and scale up when it comes to carbon removal? Well, a, a couple of things just sort of back up on Earth A Network's role in all of this. And, um, you know, we're the organization that sort of kick-started the modern environmental movement. But we've been aware over the last 20 years of how negative, I guess you'd say, the public response was to constantly moving to mitigate and adapt. And for us, it was um, dealing with CO2 and carbon and uh, adapting to whatever the change is. And we found this all to be very negative, driving down both public awareness and support. So we began to look, and thanks to Rick and other people, um, at what we think is the next best thing, the third leg of the chair is, um, I'll take a little bit of credit for, although it's pretty easy to think of that. Uh, but while we're grappling with, you know, climate, um, the resistance to the science and global leadership issues and corporations that are care, you know, to maintain the status quo, we've decided that we're going to focus on restoration uh, and partnering with Foundation for Climate Restoration, among others. But we have almost a billion people participating in Earth Day and it's a long season. So we are running, uh, we started a couple of weeks ago on promoting natural systems regeneration. And so to that end, we're focused on three different areas, forests, um, agriculture, and oceans. 
And um, we have a Tom Lovejoy, who most of you know, as a supporter and um, advisor to us. And we've talked to him about uh, whether or not um, ecosystems in general and the restoration of them. And it's the decade of restoration, as you know, for um, the UN is that he and we think um, the uh, amount left in our ecosystems is roughly the equivalent to the e ecosystem services, roughly the equivalent to the gigatons that we need to remove. So why not continue to focus on natural systems? And again, they range from a broad range of issues under ag, our regenerative ag and grasslands and a whole bunch of things, forests and uh, oceans, of course, where we see a huge amount of opportunity. We are also really interested in the tech uh, side and we are becoming educated. Um, we are cautious, but uh, we are doing our homework. It makes a great deal of sense to invest in some of the technologies that um, are going through the process, including the one we just heard about for removing carbon and finding a way to use technology and natural systems uh, in an integrative fashion. Thank you so much, Kathleen. I'm going to go over to Frederick. Frederick, you've been involved in financial investing, uh, in capital markets, in really generating the uh, financial resources for environmental sustainability for much of your career. Why do you see and your, your new company see carbon removal as a great new opportunity. Frederick? Well, um, as Kathleen, uh, there is a lot of technology uh, that has been backed by early stage investors, by VCs, that are coming to a stage where they become investable to scale. And um, I'm, I'm very, um, I would say, optimistic about the situation today, both in the U.S. and in Europe. Europe has today, with its Green Deal, made a big leap forward in pushing larger corporations to, um, to deal with sustainability more generally, but also, obviously, carbon reduction. And this group of VC-backed uh, technology entrepreneurs are now ready to be funded and to scale and to bring solutions which are really uh, addressing the problem. So I, I see a lot more capital available for... Uh, the scale up of these models, um, and that is one of the reasons why you know we set up Planet First as backing mainly European headquartered businesses to scale up uh, and to become world leaders, hopefully with uh, the help of of capital and talent to help them scale. And if I could ask you the same question I asked Lori, what are some of the policies that would enable even greater private sector financial investment in this sector? Well, I think at the moment, um, the policies that the Green Deal are pushing uh, are, are actually a great leap forward, and they will actually bring a lot of capital to the sector. Uh, I think, you know, the more the other blocks are um, increasing, raising the bar, you know, China just announced that they wanted to be uh, carbon neutral by, I think, 2060. Um, you know, fantastic uh, um, and, and quite surprising uh, uh, um, support to the cause, which I think will bring technology, state-backed, state, state -backed, but also privately-backed uh, technology to the fore. So I, I think that the, suddenly we see the first beginnings of a world coalition on this issue, um, and, and the Chinese government's uh, uh, recent announcement, or today's announcement, I think is a great testimony to the fact that um, things are going to be funded uh, by governments and private sector. Fantastic. And it is an, an age and a sector that is going to need tremendous public-private partnerships. We completely agree. I'm going to go over to you, Victoria. You know, say a little bit about Orb Media and how you translate uh, global sustainability, environmental, social environmental sustainability issues into locally actionable information and why maybe carbon removal could be another area in which Orb Media can play a major role. Victoria? Yeah, thank you. Um, Orb Media works on a global level with global comparative data and research, and we provide uh, innovative research and innovative ways of packaging sustainability information to news media organizations that might not otherwise have the uh, budgets or um, bandwidth to do future-facing stories about the sustainability issues that affect all of us. So obviously, this topic rolls right into what we want people around the world to be thinking and talking about on a global level. Climate change, 
obviously has been quite polarizing, um, specifically domestically, but all over the world for many years. And so to be able to move into a space where we can start acting um, as a uh, global community, in addition to creating uh, regulatory changes from a leadership standpoint, um, at a governmental leadership standpoint, we really need to empower people to have a sense of um, personal duty and action about what they can do to make that change. The conversation around climate change, the news reporting around climate change has been quite negative. Um, from an a emotional psychology perspective, there's nothing less shareable, less viral than the way that um, uh, the opportunities in climate change have been able to be uh, produced and shared with the public. So our media is really interested in looking at uh, carbon sequestration and um, other innovations in carbon removal as a way to provide a sense of uh, actionability and solutions to both media organizations who are talking about these issues and how they're affecting folks in their own homes and lives, but also as a way to uh, help people on the ground in their own communities feel like they have a sense of agency to make that change. Great. And then on this, on this note, I want to come back to you, Kathleen. You shared, of course, Earth Day Network is the, you know, the, the sort of the catalyzer of the modern global environmental movement. And you're increasingly all in on climate restoration and carbon removal. When you look at your membership all around the world, the citizens that, you know, are demanding change, why are they starting to get more and more invested and excited about climate restoration and carbon removal? Well, I think it's exactly for the reasons I started talking about and then I, we just heard about, which is uh, there's something very positive. I think I called it the it's a U.S. probably uh, expressions, what I call the Bob the Builder. We can do it. Yes, we can. Where we take a very positive approach, um, the negativity around climate change. And I'm in the messaging business and the movement building business, both. Um, so I agree completely um, with the concept that we've gone too far. It allows us to build a much more positive, um, you know, sort of both thought process and um, reaction, both in legislation and regulation. And so it's much more hopeful. And so to that end, we're looking at ways we can get engaged in explaining technology to people because we need to build that green consumer movement. We need to build the green jobs ready workforce. We need to build educated and active and engaged citizens. So we're the bottom of the pyramid, hoping to prop all of you up and build that movement from the ground up because it needs to be one that's both positive, but also super active. And so that's what we're doing. And we are convinced that it's not just the messaging, but the tech and the natural systems um, and natural processes that we can put together and actually perhaps do more than, um, what they expect of us and not wait, certainly, um, and maybe get ahead of the um, fossil fuel um, community uh, in a way that becomes really positive and engenders a lot of hope and enthusiasm. Fantastic. Rick, I'm going to come back to you. So uh, the Foundation for Climate Restoration had a first UN forum last year and then just came out as hot off the heels of a second one, Climate Week. What are the changes you've seen? What are some of the stakeholders and groups that are starting to engage that you wouldn't have expected to have been so active already in carbon removal and climate restoration. Thank you, Sanjeev. So you were there. So last year at the UN, when we launched the foundation globally at UN General Assembly, honestly, we were, you know, calling up people and trying to make sure they would show up. And, and we were really pulling teeth to get speakers. Kathleen was one of the wonderful people that, that joined us, but to, to have speakers. Fast forward a year later, and now it's the investment community, the science community, the entrepreneurs, um, it's across the board you're seeing people that want to engage on climate restoration. Again, with agreeing with my colleagues, I think on one hand it's the sense of hope, but it's also the sense of we can do this to, to the Bob the Builder. It's that people, you know, what I, what I think that, you know, I was in the climate space for almost 20 years in the UN system, and I think that it's great that we woke people up, but then we woke them up and we paralyzed them if it's too late. And, and it's not too late. And I think that people are hearing the message that we can um, invest in these solutions with natural and technological and that we can restore the climate this is a positive message. I think that, um, you know, my friend, Christine Harada, uh, we were talking about this the other day. And, and one of the things that she said is that look at 10, 15 years ago, um, the renewable um, uh, wind and, and, um, and solar industry, it was shaky. 
and look at what it is today. And so I think that, you know, I've had colleagues say to me, you're working 10 years in the future. The work that we're doing right now will pay off in 2030, 2040, and 2050. So it's very exciting to see, again, from my 80-year-old mother and, and sort of uh, her constituency to people in the investment field, the youth, the faith, um, across all these different sectors, people are, are really wanting to be engaged. Absolutely. I mean, and if I could just identify too, I mean, the foundation was so critical in getting, right, the Catholic Church and the Pope to to uh, support climate restoration, right, Rick? Yeah, I mean, I don't, I, I don't want to take credit for the Pope's words, but um, on September 1st in his, uh, in his annual letter, the Pope did say, uh, climate restoration and we must restore our common home and he did call for climate restoration so you know it's happening you're, you're seeing it more and more and more and you know when we were in Davos, microsoft uh, announced this very bold and uh, audacious uh commitment not only to go to carbon neutral by 2030 but to remove all of its carbon footprint from the time it was founded in 1970 by 2050 which is the kind of bold action we're seeing across the board um, yeah. You know, when you talked about going to $100 uh, dollars a ton, uh, for the ordinary person, that still seems like a lot. What does that really mean? And where, you know, what is that, you know, where do we really need to get to, to make this commercially viable, to make it economically uh, viable? Um, so I guess it, at $100 a ton, um, you know, I did some quick math. I guess, actually, let's go back in 2005. Um, it was estimated that it would cost sort of one to two percent of global GDP in order to solve climate change and, and to do the things we need to do. Um, fast forward to today, if, if director capture and sequestration together were $150 a ton, it would cost us about six percent of global GDP in order to go to net zero and, uh, and do the work that we need to do. And that is still a lot of money. 6% of global GDP is a lot of money. So that's why we're driving our solution. And there will be lots of other solutions that come online to help us remove carbon. Um, but why we need to drive that cost even lower. But what it is, is at $150 a ton, it will be achievable. And so that changes it from, you know, we have no hope. Uh, we don't know how to solve climate change to we have all the solutions we need together, natural and technological solutions. Um, and so now it's just a question of do we want to spend that money or not? And how do we drive further innovation and accelerate the rollout of, of less and less expensive solutions. So, I mean, we're really excited to be bringing our technology online and be going where we're going. Yeah, we'll keep driving costs down, but it is it is affordable. It's a choice that we're making to not solve climate change. Um, and we just need to go faster and foster those, all of those solutions. That's really great. When it comes to you, Victoria, you know, obviously what's you know changed a lot over the last two or three years is the role of youth in the environmental movement, and particularly climate change with Greta, but so many, many more. Greta was, you know, obviously the forerunner of the vanguard, but we see that around the world. Certainly my own children, 20, 15, and 6, they're climate, you know, uh, social agents, transformation agents. When you think about your work and think about carbon removal and climate restoration, do you think that this message, which, you know, Kathleen, Rick, everybody is sharing, and I certainly believe is an optimistic message, will really reach those young people, those Gen X, Gen Y, Gen Z, millennials, who do want to see real action and transformation happen. Yeah, absolutely. I think that um, if you can give a generation something to rally behind that feels uh, achievable to them, they're going to do it. But I think one of the reasons why um, these personalities are coming out in such a successful uh, viral way is because they're doing two things that are very successful when it comes to mind shifts in big issues like this. One is personification of the issue. They're giving a face to how this is affecting people in their own communities and rallying the faces of that around the world by building a movement of people who look like them, right? And the second is uh, personalization. So they're starting to understand it's not just, you know, carbon elsewhere in the world or the air in China that's the problem. It's the air in their hometown and their communities. So I think what we see from these uh, movements of students and young people isn't just their passion to grab onto something that they can actually feel like they can change and a platform where they can change it, but also the reaction that we as the audience are having on a deep psychological level, on a deep um, uh, fundamental understanding level of where our role fits in that. I think in the past, we haven't had the tools to allow that to happen um, in a really grassroots accessible way. So that's why we're seeing some really big changes in attitude in younger folks because they're finding that to be 
very easy to step into um, as opposed to the relationship that we had in media with the past, which was very, you know, top down. The media is going to tell us what's happening and then we have to receive that information and make a decision on our own in our own houses and community. It's a much more back and forth dialogue now. And I think those platforms make a huge difference to creating action. And to Victoria's point, go ahead, please, Frederick, jump in. To Victoria's point, I think um, if the EU and and Ursula von der Leyen has taken the step of drafting and, and, and implementing now her Green Deal, it's because the consumers are behind it, the voters are behind it, and they they, they get it that you know the new they don't want to be. Oh, we lost everyone. Uh, you just keep speaking, Frederick. I think we can hear you. Please go. On. So, 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 yeah, yeah. so they, they want to consume locally. They're making choices which are making a difference to the companies that are producing the goods, who are changing uh, the way they are uh, considering uh, producing. And so, I think the consumer-led reform is happening, and that is why certain countries and the EU has taken the right steps, are making the right moves, and they are pushing companies to reduce every year the level of carbon emissions, and to also price carbon. I think it's very important to go back to this issue of pricing. You know, regenerative agriculture can also be a success if there is a price to what farmers are doing in in regenerating land and and, and making their land carbon neutral. Um, It is happening. It's a market that is developing uh, increasingly, and, and a lot of intermediaries are putting themselves in the carbon market to the benefit, uh, in my view, of, of, of climate and to and, and the preservation of our biosphere. That's fantastic. In fact, and while we have you, Frederick, you know, what we're starting to see, and, and given all your expertise, we'd love your wisdom on this, is the emerging of a very complex financial financing ecosystem, right? From early stage investors all the way through institutional investors. You know, how do you see this playing out? What are some key sort of developments that you're seeing in, in, in this sort of ecosystem of financing resource mobilization uh, for these types of technological and natural solutions? So, so what I'm seeing is that um, there's been a lot of money and a lot of attention to early stage venture um, uh, projects, technology led, um, who were very much, um, I would say, before the curve commercially. Um, those companies are now emerging and the consumers are also pulling their services and their goods. And that is actually attracting a new group of investors who are looking at growth. And growth <clears throat> is basically meaning scaling the businesses to a point where they can either go public or they become, um, uh, they, 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 they become sold to a, a, an enterprise that want to integrate that technology. Um, to give you an example of a past uh, experience, which is not exactly in the carbon capture, but it is in consumer-led um, uh, business, which is Oakley. Um, Oakley, which some of you will know, which is a, a, um, a milk that was developed out of oat, uh, very sustainable, locally produced, uh, out of Sweden. Um, and these people went to fight against um, the agricultural lobby of producing milk on the grounds of uh, ca- carbon production. And the movement has taken... You know, initially it was taking a lot of friends and family money, and then more institutional money came in and saw the business grow from, you know, 200 million in sales, sorry, 100 million in sales to uh, 500 million in sales. And that type of business is really telling you, well, consumers are ready. Consumers are ready to buy something that is better for them and better for nature. And that is where money is going to now. Smart money is going to those two things, better for you, better for the people. Sorry, better for the people, better for the planet. (laughs) Fair enough. I'm going to come back to you, Rick. Rick, over the last, since Davos, we launched the Global Carbon Removal Task Force uh, between the Thunderbird School of Global Management and ASU and the foundation. Why don't you share with our participants and audience the progress we've made, what the Carbon Task Force is doing, and the goals and the road to Glasgow, as we call it, in terms of carbon removal. Rick? Yeah, sure. So um, we launched it, as as Sanjeev said. This is a global task force carbon removal. It has about 30, 32 different uh, partners. Um, Kathleen Rogers, Earth Day is one, Carbon Engineering and others. 
And what we're doing is working on the policy solutions and the markets um, around carbon removal. Um, last week, yes, it was only last week, last week during the UN Climate Week, NYC, um, the Carbon Removal Task Force, one of our um, founding partners, the uh, government of Kenya, um, has put into the UN system or is in the process of putting into the UN system a resolution for the General Assembly um, for member states to consider calling, uh, recognizing climate restoration as the third pillar of climate action and calling on um, the COP26 to have a full strategy on um, carbon removal and climate restoration um, for uh, November of next year in Glasgow. This is really amazing because now you're bringing in the member states for them to be able to debate it, to grow it, to understand it. This will drive things like, hopefully, um, an IPC, IPC special report on um, climate restoration and carbon removal. That's important because then that gives license to universities and scientists to say, we need to do the research on this, which is critically important to the billion constituency that Earth Day has across the planet. They wanna see these kinds of solutions implemented, but carefully and safely and tested. And this will then give license to universities to, to seek the kind of financing that will allow that kind of research to do. So it's the beginning of a series of dominoes that we see falling and it all, you know, starts with groups like this, um, but the Carbon Removal Task Force um, has been has been pretty amazing. I, I, I'm hesitant because we don't have permission for some of the names um, that are that have joined it, but uh, let's just say some of them have been mentioned here already today, but we're, we're expecting to, to really grow this over the next year. We launched the road to Glasgow um, with the Carbon Removal Task Force um, last week, as I said, with the idea being that more and more partners to plead please join us, anyone who, who wants to participate and learn more about it, but join us on this journey so that when we get to Glasgow next um, November, climate restoration and, and carbon removal is a full partner with mitigation and adaptation. That is the strategy over the next year. Absolutely, and the goal is, right, Rick, to launch a full-scale, multi-stakeholder global partnership on carbon removal uh, by Glasgow. Uh, that would be a real uh, next-generation SDG 7 part partnership and really push for a quantitative target on carbon removal, getting us back to at least 300 parts per million, if not lower, where humanity flourished uh, for most of our, our you know, planetary history. So uh, an exciting... Go ahead, Rick. Go ahead, jump right, right in. Back to pre-industrial levels. We can do this by 2050. Fantastic. So we're going to go round robin with our final set of questions. The final question, which is, uh, each panelist has been going to be handed a magic wand, and they can identify two or three very rapidly, two or three game-changing uh, uh, kinds of actions or um, ish, uh, uh, institutions or whatever it might be, a policy, whatever that can really be catalytic towards climate transformation and carbon removal, climate restoration is part of that. I'm going to start with you, Victoria. You've got the wand. Give us one or two or three. Yeah, I would say if we were able to make uh, the story and the narrative around climate solutions as ubiquitous as the other forms of entertainment and media that we consume on a daily basis, and we all, through mere exposure effect, were <laughs> exposed to uh, solutions on a daily basis, I think that we would all be making different efforts and different moves towards solutions a much faster. Fantastic. Kathleen, over to you. So I'd agree uh, for starters, but I think uh, building political will is my business. And I think it's at the heart of what uh, we need to do collectively so that we have build a groundswell of people who are enthusiastic about it or even understand it, but it's such an easier, more palatable concept to restore than to eliminate. So uh, building global political will. And then I think I'd agree on the finance side, um, having government signal to investors and others that they're behind this is a critical step in uh, marrying the investments that we need and also the signal to the people that um, they're going to work with them to make this all happen in one big, beautiful puzzle coming together. Thank you so much, Kathy. Over to you, Frederick. The wand is yours, my friend. <clears throat> well... I think, uh, and, and this may be slightly uh, curious to you, but I find that agriculture is a place where so much can be done and the consumers are leading the way in um, transforming uh, the way they eat, the way they purchase. And I think if we can get agriculture to become all regenerative, 
um, and to create, therefore, to become carbon neutral uh, or carbon positive, that would, that would, uh, sorry, carbon negative, that would be fantastic and would achieve a big reduction in the source of carbon that we all playing with. I think that is through consumers and, of course, through policy and, I would say, redirecting the food uh, ag and agricultural policy of the various blocks will be tremendously helpful to achieve that. And Europe is leading the way there at the moment. Hopefully, other blocks will follow. Absolutely. And I just want to say that for us, carbon negative is climate and people positive. <laughs> so <laughs> so uh, over to you, Lori. You have the magic wand. What two or three things could really accelerate, be catalytic? So thanks. Uh, I, I love having the magic wand in my hand. Um, so, so I guess, you know, when, <laughs> when we look out 10 or 20 years, will we have built many of our 1 million ton per year DAC plants? We will. The policies will will support that and, and we'll have built them. And so for me, the question is, how do we go faster? How do we do that faster? And and so what's really exciting is to see companies and, and um, individuals stepping up and saying, we, we want to voluntarily start to remove carbon at scale and put real dollars behind it because we need to go faster. And, and having that recognition happening is fantastic. And of course, um, that can add demand and that can make us go faster. So what what would help us accelerate all of that uh, would be help in aggregating that demand. How do you make it possible for a consumer, an individual or a smaller company um, to participate given that one of our plants removes a total of 30 million tons over its lifetime? How do you take a small piece of that? And so what we see happening is that some companies are stepping up and saying, I'm going to help the consumer um, decarbonize the transportation of that good to them by making it easy to facilitate that through through a, a company like Carbon Engineering doing direct air capture. So um, help to aggregate voluntary demand in the short term will actually really help us accelerate and go faster than what would have otherwise gotten built under government policies. We also need those really uh, market-based government policies to help us. Um, those will develop over the medium to long term, but, but um, aggregate consumer interest uh, in the short term will really sort of put the foot on the gas and we're really excited about that. And it very much is that we are creating an entirely new market, right, Lori? And we have to match that supply with demand and make that incredibly dynamic. Um, over to you, Rick. Final thoughts. You have the wand. What two or three things can really be catalytic for climate restoration and carbon removal at scale? Well, I feel lucky to get the wand last because my magic wand is that every person on the planet to understand that they have a magic wand. They can vote. They can use their wallet. They can use their voice. Uh, wherever you are, you can demand this. You can you can demand private capital. You can demand um, public um, investment. You can demand policy change. Um, you have a voice. Um, Kathleen Rogers is leading Vote Earth, Vote Early. Everyone should be out there using their voice, whether you're in the pews, whether you're at school, whether you're at work, if you're a youth. If you're if you're a grandparent, you, you want to be able to look at your grandchild and say, I did every single thing I could. So everybody has a magic wand and they should use it. Thank you so much. So we're wrapping up here as certainly as a as a dean of a global business leadership and management school. My own view I want to add is that the private sector has an incredible opportunity here to really uh, be catalytic in creating win-win solutions alongside government, alongside civil society and citizens and academic institutions. There's a huge market out there in terms of carbon re removal that is emerging and that can rapidly evolve and can be uh, uh, catalytic for advancing sustainable and equitable prosperity around the world, which is certainly our vision. I want to thank Harassis, our incredible partner uh, here for organizing this event, all the team at the Thunderbird that made this possible, our fantastic rock star panel here. Please stay safe and healthy, everyone, uh, and make sure to push for carbon removal and climate restoration, the critical third pillar in climate transformation. All the best. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you all. Bye. 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 <laughs>